labor law, labor unions can be fined massively every day for putting up secondary pickets because they violate corporate property rights. Decision making is now a property right of the corporate form, corporate property right. So for example, if we think about it, and again, we, I think if throughout the 20th century we've become colonized enough that we don't really understand this anymore, colonized enough in our minds, but how many people when you pay your monthly utility bill think to yourself, how come it's not up to me and all the other people paying the bill to decide where that money's gonna be invested? I think I mentioned that at the beginning. We don't think about it, you know, is it gonna give us a whole new kind of, of infrastructure and renewable energy, or is it gonna build another dam, or is it gonna go to the pockets of rich, of rich people? We don't think about it. Well, that decision making is a, is a, proper, is a protected Supreme Court decision property right of the corporate person. The decision making is a property right. So what that means is that production decisions made by corporations, investment decisions, distribution decisions, the way work is organized decisions are all assumed to be protected property rights of the corporate person. The board of directors has protection of all of that stuff in our supposed democratic republic because they have corporate rights. And this is really a comprehensive system, right, in place. They built this system for almost two centuries. And we keep fighting one corporate arm at a time, right? They keep building rights, and we keep fighting through almost entirely nowhere else but the regulatory system to stop corporate harms one at a time, to stop that factory, to stop that toxic emission in the bay, to stop those thousand living wage jobs from leaving the country. And that's mostly what our activism is around corporate power. It's single issue, one at a time, conventional activism. And it's all within the framework of the regulatory system, almost always. And what's the regulatory system? Well, it turns out that the regulatory system was founded in the 1880s in secret negotiations, and this is not a conspiracy theory, it's out there if you want to find it, in secret negotiations between railroad company executives and the Attorney, General's, the Attorney General of the United States. And what they came up with is, this is the height of the populist era, 1870s, 80s, 90s, absolutely mass outrage against the harms being caused by the railroad corporations, which were the first really giant corporations in the country. And the government decided to create a whole new body of law called regulatory law, each with its own agency, to regulate citizen outrage. That's really what regulations are. I have a colleague, uh, actually Jane Ann Morris, who wrote the gambling book, who says, the primary purpose of environmental law is to regulate environmental activism. The primary <laughs> purpose of labor law is to regulate labor union activism, labor movement activism, okay? And it works. And it started in the 1800s, and it works. It funnels citizen outrage as we people into single issue activism. And it was designed, and they have, and they actually have minutes from these early meetings. It was designed to look like the government was responding directly to citizen outrage, and in, a, and in actuality, they're creating new systems of law that funnel us into oblivion, where we have no power to say no. Now all we have power to do is to ask for better regulations. What's a regulation? It's allowing a certain amount of harm which we're told is a safe level of harm, right? Parts of environmental law to a large degree is law that defines safe levels of various kinds of poisons in our environment, in our food, in our water, right? And so one regulatory agency after another was created starting in the 1880s to funnel citizen outrage each time there was a major uprising of citizens. So turn of the century, people have perhaps read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. You have a mass uprising of Americans against um, dangers in the food industry. What does the government do? It creates the Food and Drug Administration. And it funnels citizen outrage about unsafe food into a regulatory agency. And that's where we've been for 100 plus years. And so we've been colonized for 130 years or so. We don't understand where our power lies. Our power lies as we the people, as the sovereign people, governing ourselves. 
Now let me read you the first few sentences of Oregon's state constitution, and your state constitution is almost identical. If I'd been a little better organized, I would be reading New York State Constitution, so my apologies for that. Article 1, Bill of Rights. Section 1, Natural Rights Inherent in People. This is the very beginning of every state constitution. We declare that all power is inherent in the people, and all free governments are founded on their authority, and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. And they have at all times a right to alter, reform, or abolish the government in such manner as they may think proper. Your constitution in this state reads very similarly to that. I'm going to read it again. Section 1, natural rights inherent in people. We declare that all power is inherent in the people, and all free governments are founded on their authority, and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. And they have at all times the right to alter, reform, or abolish the government, in such a manner as they may think proper. Right? That's where our power lies, right? And the preamble of the Constitution has very similar language of the federal Constitution. So that's my history presentation. And now I'm going to shift over and, um, and tell you about these extraordinary uprisings that are happening in 130 communities in six states in the Northeast. Um, but let me, I'll maybe take a couple of questions or comments before we go there. And I'm also wondering if, um, two other things before we start. So I'd like it if a sheet of paper was passed around and I got people's names and email addresses. And if you give me your email address and you write it clearly enough that I can actually read it, um, you will get one email from me in the next day or two. I won't add you to an endless list of emails. Um, and I'll send you a lot of links of articles, interviews, uh, lectures by myself and many other colleagues around the country who do this work as their focused work so that you can start deepening your understanding of this work. Both of the movements that are the local uh, opposite of local community rights ordinances that are popping up all over the East Coast uh, and also <coughs> to deepen your understanding of this, this historical stuff that most of us, I don't think any of us learn. In fact, you know, I regularly have lawyers and law professors coming to my little two-hour workshops, and they say, you know, this is an absolutely fascinating timeline. We actually learned about all these, all of these legal cases in law school, but we didn't learn that they were about corporations winning rights over people. They were all framed as the the power of, of the American economy is growing and prospering. Um, right? It was a totally different frame, right? The business of America is business. Is corporate rights, he certain rights of people, that wasn't the frame But they learned about all these cases because they're very significant Supreme Court cases in history. So could somebody could somebody start a sheet of paper oh, for the email? Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering if uh, you are given given your the breadth of, of your understanding, yeah. if you are heartened by the Occupy movement there. that's going on there. Um, what I'm hoping, and I actually have, um, I probably don't have enough, I don't know how many people are going to be here. Let's see. There you go. Maybe it's back still on the back too. I have uh, 20 or 30 copies of, of an open letter to the Occupy Movement from the community rights folks um, saying, we think that your most powerful option is a uh, local self-governing authority to build that muscle. That that would be way more powerful than to keep pleading with, we're trying to get away from pleading with higher levels of government, sure. right? We're, this movement that I'm part of, we are sick and tired of pleading. No more pleading, no more begging. We're exercising our right and authority to govern ourselves at the municipal level. And so we're urging local Occupy communities to really contemplate that maybe your most powerful tactic would be to, to work on passing these legally binding ordinances that strip corporations of all of their constitutional rights at the local level. And that's what's happened in 130 towns in climate. Rather than everybody somehow figuring out 
how to symbolically support a constitutional amendment, or to symbolically coordinate, you know, some kind of a new pressure on, like I've seen just in the last day or two, I can't remember if it was Occupy Wall Street or different group. Actually, it was on your, I saw it on your Facebook page, your Occupy Facebook page yesterday or today was a list of eight or ten demands. And one of them was abolish, the first one was I did abolish corporate prison or something like that. I would really urge you to think about looking at that list of demands and saying, what could we pass into local law where we're exercising our right to these things rather than demanding them of our supposed powerful leaders who we're treating as Goliaths when in actually there are subordinates constitutionally. And we're begging them. So we have we do have a matrix that was, was created here years ago, and that will be the substance of our community bill of rights. I want to talk with you one on one. I I'm so tired of the, the it's much like Speak the, cell, yeah. the cell phone thing. I know I appreciate how annoying that is. In a similar way, I'm finding that I'm getting tired of the move to amend versus. Yeah. You know, yeah. So let's talk about that. I think, yeah. I think that you know, we need to really pass that. Yeah. I really passed it a long time ago. And I just, I'm finding it really hard to just yeah. let go. So I'm going to actually have help of somebody to help me facilitate. Because when I'm talking, I'm not good at knowing who had their hands up before. Sure, I'll, I'll So um, there was a hand somewhere over here that went up really early. Was it you in the back? I'm not sure. I think so. Okay. And then I'm going to turn this over to Sandy. And let's just do this for five or ten minutes, and then I'm going to switch over. And I'm going to I'm listening, but I'm grabbing these sheets. So go ahead. Well, is the, the the populist movement was basically about let's break up these huge companies. It's just too big, and, uh, and then let's regulate them. Well, guess what? As soon as you turn your back on these corporations, they'll recombine. And that's you know, not what the populist movement. Was break up the big, break, break that up the big boys. The progressive movement was about an era of the 20th century okay. that followed in the that was the, the, the next major social. Movement. All right, and then on the other, then they're, they're, at that time the big there are big opponents on the in the progressive movement were were like Big Bill Haywood, Joe Hill, Eugene B. Debs, Daniel DeLeon, and they said, no, let's let, let the working class take them over and run them democratically. And I think that looking back from our vantage point of 2010, it's pretty obvious who was right. And it will be like the folks that were saying, let's take them over and run them for the 99%. Let's occupy yeah. the workplaces. The populist movement was the last massive social movement that refused to concede that corporations should have rights, that refused to concede that corporations should be part of the body culture. The progressive movement, starting in the early 20th century, was the first, was the next mass movement it welcomed enlightened corporate leaders as its leaders. It welcomed corporate institutions into the body politic. Now again, that's a big frame. That's not the official story of, of the progressive era. There is a book called The Triumph of Conservatism, which is, uh, which is the framing that I just said. Triumph of Conservatism, a historic book. And I have, I have this open letter from the community rights folks to the Occupy movement. If like every third person or every fourth person would take one, you could make a bunch of copies. Um, they're all for you. Well, um, would, would you just touch on and give an example, or as a, as a shiny example, what Pittsburgh is doing, what's in the process of that sustainable energy About ordinance? To do that. I, I'm sure you are, but it's yeah. just like, it'll just snap yeah. people right to I'm not quite there the possibilities. Thank you. 10 minutes more and I'm there. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering what this looks like at a state level because it seems like with the activity that's going to be going on at the Capitol this session and with the next session and what looks like all of this organization going on to maintain the same pressure, we'd really like to see what community rights would look like written into the state constitution. Um, I'm going to get to that also in about 20 minutes. Um, and if I have it, would you please tell, raise your hand high and make me get back to that? in the last 15 or 20 minutes, but I don't want to jump ahead. So just to comment, Paul, I've been saying for a while, just on a visceral gut level without knowing all the details of the history that you presented, that it really feels like we've gone back to a, like a monarchy or a, you know, whatever you want to call it. And the history that you just gave sounds like pretty early on, 
although we may have started out as trying to undo the king and empower the corporations, that very quickly it went back to that in, in this country. And that your presentation just really helped validate something that I've been saying. We're going back to this like the king and the you know, before the revolution. And so that's why people are in the streets. My colleagues and I frame it as that up in, from the American Revolution to the late 1800s, we had elite rule by individuals who were mostly, we had a slaveholder society, where the rich and the powerful held slaves, and they were the 10%, and they, they made all the decisions, because they were persons, and no one else was. As more and more people started to become enfranchised, and became persons under law, withstanding under law, it became essential for that 10% to come up with a different strategy to maintain minority rule. And the strategy was the corporate form. So for the first century, the corporate form wasn't essential. They had all the power they needed as 10% of the population, the elite, who had personhood. Once all of these enfranchisement movements were going on, by the late 1800s, early 1900s, it became more and more important for the corporation, for those individuals to have a the corporation as the legal form, it be, it's becoming the dominant institution of our time. It's, it's, break, it's broken all of the requirements, prohibitions, subordinations, right? It's becoming the form of the legal rule. And it has been ever since. So you can actually say, we've never, and I think people know this in their gut, we've never had democracy in the United States, right? We went from 10% to a corporate rule. That's not democracy. And it is now the, the preferred form of domination, right? This the 10% now hides behind the corporate form, and the corporation has all of its powers, which the state defends. I'm sure, that's the short thing. Um, yeah, I operate under the assumption that, um, well, one, I didn't grow up with any um, notion of community rights. I, I don't think any has, um, which is probably part of our our attitude part of the problem. But the, the, also the other part is that I also assume that the, the federal laws, that if we if we work in that direction, that has more power than the community laws. So um, I, I would like, I'm sure you might, um, yeah, in your I'm framework, to that, address that. Same with the state question. But in general, the, you know, very, very generally, before I get there, if we, don't, we can't organize for federal power if we don't even have organization for local power. We can't organize for state constitutional change if we haven't built anything yet. We have no, we haven't built political power yet, right? The, move, the, move, the, um, the occupation hasn't proven that it has any sustained capacity yet, right? And so we're very impatient and we're used to networking, not organizing, right? Very few people organize anymore, you know? We use electronic mediums to network. And that's, you know, we're not gonna build mass movement through Facebook, right? Facebook, Mass movement is built through organizing, face-to-face -face building of relationships with people who are other, who are not like you, right? And getting past your own personal fears to figure out how to make alliances across these, what we assume are huge chasms, right? So there isn't a there there yet. We have no state power. We have no federal power. So um, I'll get to the question in a slightly different way in a few minutes, but that's a piece of the answer. Yeah, you might, and everybody might be uh, asking the same thing. And I'm just going to give this example of the, the states. I think 71% of the people of California passed the medical marijuana law. <coughs> but the federal government has come back in and has superseded the people voting for these rights. And so I'm wondering how the people in Pennsylvania and Maine are getting these to, to stick so that these local and state You're all jumping are... ahead of my presentation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just move um, on to the presentation. Yeah. Anybody who is not about something I haven't talked about yet, responding to something I'm already talking about, raise your hand. Okay. Okay, and then I'm going to move on. Yeah, I understand uh, the critique of single issue organizing as everyone fighting separately. Um, but as you know, I was involved in movement against uh, mining companies in Wisconsin. And it seemed like a single issue, but as people became more and more frustrated with the regulatory framework, turned more to their local governments, and especially to tribal governments exerting their sovereignty, um, they started to order the corporations not to do certain things, and it worked. It drove the corporations out. They stitched together their single issue 
with people fighting water companies and power companies. So I'm wondering if you still, if you see single issues as having the potential as a door or a portal into this kind of work that it shouldn't be left behind or if it's inherently dangerous. Well, you're talking about single issue activism within the context of native sovereignty rights. And that's a kind of rights-based strategy. So I, I would say that's significantly in the direction of what I'm about to be talking about. But I would say, minus native sovereignty rights, if we're talking about, about non-native activists fighting as non-native activists, um, my understanding is that all you can do through the regulatory structure is to what Dave Brower once upon a time said, the best I've ever managed is to slow the rate at which things get worse. Mm -hmm. right? The grandfather of the modern environmental movement. So the question really is, Olten, is can, when you won, did you actually withdraw the right of the corporation to come back two years from now and make the same application? Or are you going to have to launch the campaign again because all you did was stop them then and sooner or later they'll come back again? So that's the question. You know, it's about power. Did you withdraw their power <coughs> to just repeat the, the same proposal over and over and over? You're right, it was tribal sovereignty and they actually the tribes acquired the land. Right, so right, because you've got that added legal structure that you're able to use. Okay, last. <clears throat> Especially with your uh, call to target local government, I thought this was an appropriate time to uh, just let people know about the uh, couple of uh, items that I ran by you this morning, and I wished I'd made no more copies now. The Community Values Ordinance, which was presented to the cities of Olympia and Tumwater six years ago, January 2006, and I can tell you more later on about where that is at this point. I made some copies. I would suggest that if you look at it and want a copy, again, email addresses, I'll get back to you. Cool. Give me a time check, somebody. 321. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to jump back in and tell you about these uprisings going on in 130 communities. And I also, I thought I brought my, my um, wool hat, but I can't seem to find it. And I always pass a hat and ask for donations towards my basic survival. Because this is the work I do full time. So if you can afford quarters or dollars or tens or whatever you want to throw in there toward my survival to do this work full time, could somebody, I see a hat, I don't know if it's available, could somebody start passing their hat? And, um, and I'm not asking you to feel obligated to do this, but if you call to make a donation towards this work, that would be awesome. So, um, so continuing on, about a dozen years ago, in a tiny little township called Wells Township, Pennsylvania, a population of about 520 people who were primarily Republican, conservative farmers of hogs, there was a family hog farm economy in Wells Township. And they had spent year after year trying to stop a 15,000 head hog farm from being placed in their township. A factory farm of hogs, 15,000 hogs, in a, in a rural community where the economy was family farms. And for three or four years, they tried to figure out how to stop these hogs, this factory, from coming into their town. And no matter what government uh, level they spoke with, all they were told over and over is, there is no way to say no, that's not an option. But we can help you to regulate the hog farm. Now what does that mean? Well again, regulating means allowing. Right? You can't say no, you have to allow it. Why do you have to allow it? Because of something called state preemption. State preemption means that the state will not allow a local government to ban something which the state considers legal. It's that simple, simple. If the state regulates hot, uh, factory farms, that by definition means they're legal, right? Because regulating is allowed. And if the state regulates something, a local community can't prohibit it. That's state preemption. Now, the, the medical marijuana thing that was raised is a really good example of, it, of, of that. The federal government claims civil <coughs> legal jurisdiction over drug policy in the United States. California, many years ago, passes Prop 215 through the ballot box. The voters give themselves the authority to define what medical marijuana is going to be and to create a system where people can get safe, legal access to marijuana. Medical marijuana laws violate federal 
drug policy laws, which is why the federal government is continuing to try to stop it. Now, the way it was framed by the person who mentioned that, you would think that the federal government is winning. But they're not winning. Let's get real about this. There is a crisis of jurisdiction that was created when the state government passed that law. Because what's happening now is before the law was passed, Prop 215, you had the federal government demanding that they had sole authority, and they're shutting down you know, pot growers, pot smokers, blah, blah, blah. After Prop 215 is passed, the state legislature, which is empowered to enforce state law, the Attorney General of California, who's empowered to enforce state law, the governor, etc., they're all required to enforce the law the voters passed. They're not there to enforce federal law. That's not their job. They're empowered to enforce state law. You created a crisis of jurisdiction. That's what we want. That's what this is in 130 communities. Now the federal government is forced to deal with the state legislature, the state attorney general, the county's sheriff departments, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who all have loyalty oaths to state law, ultimately. Right? That's you created just what you want to create. So yes, the federal government is now cracking down again on some clinics and some major pot growers. But think about it. You have millions and millions of people, I believe now in the state, certainly hundreds of thousands, who are legally growing and smoking pot in the state of California. The same, the same is true in your state, right? You've had medical marijuana laws for quite a while, right? You're losing? I don't think so, right? At some point, the federal government has to acknowledge that they lost. They may not be losing legally still, but they've lost politically. They've lost. So that's what's happening in these 130 communities, is 130 communities have stepped outside of regulatory and zoning law, which is what they're told are their only legal structures they can use to regulate corporate activity, right? No, we don't want the Walmart here, but we'll let it be over there. That's zoning law, right? And regulatory law is all about ameliorating harms around the edges, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> We're not comfortable with 2,000 hogs in a warehouse, how about 1,000? We're not comfortable with this shit pond from the hog farm being that close to somebody's house, how about 200 feet further away? Right? Corporations are delighted to make those kinds of compromise. That's regulatory law, right? ameliorating the harms around the edges. This community was saying, we're tired of that. Where is it in law that it says that we don't have the authority to say no, right? We've read our state constitution. We've read the preamble of the federal constitution. We took civics in school. It says that we have the highest authority in the land. We the people are the sovereign. Where the hell is that law that we can enforce? It wasn't anywhere. So they worked with a public interest law firm, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. You can see this way back there. C-E-L-D-F. Community Environmental Legal Defense Law, which is a public interest environmental law firm from Pennsylvania. And they and the, they literally asked these public interest attorneys, can you help us understand why we can't say no to a factory farm in our own town where we have almost unanimous agreement we don't want it here? And the cell with attorneys who were all trained in regulatory environmental laws, we don't know. We don't know. But let's figure it out together. And they basically started studying legal history. And what they realized was corporations have won constitutional right after constitutional right for 190 years, and their rights trump our rights. It's as simple as that. And state preemption, which is the relationship between a parent and a child, is the same as a state to a local government. Because the local government is only allowed to pass laws in the arenas of law that the state explicitly allows it to, right? That state, that's, that's, that's there's two things, there's state preemption and there's something called Dillon's Rule, D-I-L-L-O-N apostrophe S. And these are two sides of the same coin. One says, state preemption says, if we call it legal at the state level, a local government can't ban it. And Dillon's Rule says, the local governments can only pass laws on issue areas that the state government explicitly allows them to pass laws about. Right? It's the parent-child relationship. 
So these folks are stepping out of that, and they said to the, to the regulatory environmental attorneys at Selva, help us pass a law that bans corporate, corporate ag in our town. And they're like, okay, we'll give it a try. So a dozen years ago or so, Wells Township passed the Anti-Corporate Farming Ordinance. That's what it was called. And it did some very simple things that had never been done before in the United States. 510 farmers in this little village in a conservative community in Pennsylvania. It banned all non-family-owned corporations from engaging in farming or owning farmland. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. It, it stripped corp agriculture corporations of their constitutional rights within the municipal boundaries. And it refused to recognize state preemption because it violated the, their state constitution's right of local self government And it passed, overwhelmingly by the township supervisors elected. One year later, five more communities in rural Pennsylvania, again all conservative, had passed exactly the same ordinance. Another few years later, dozens of communities passed the same ordinance across rural Pennsylvania. And now they were starting to deal with other issues. Some were banning corporate uh, drilling for, uh, for groundwater to put in bottles and plastic bottles and sell, bottling plant corporations. Um, in Maine, two communities stopped uh, Poland Springs, which is a Nestle Corporation brand, uh, from opening bottle plants in two communities in Maine through these community rights ordinances. Well, where, while simultaneously other communities working within the regulatory structure, begging regulators to stop these things went nowhere. Again, regulatory law is not about no. It's not about the right to define. It's harms around the edges. So every community, one after another, was stepping out of regulatory and zoning laws and state preemption laws and corporate rights claims and saying, we're doing it anyway. We are exercising our right of community self-government which we understand is one of our inherent rights under our state constitution and the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. And then something very extraordinary happened a few years ago. They had what started to be, you know, it was kind of like a collective aha moment in all these communities, dozens and dozens of them already now in three or four states, is they realized if we're building a movement of community self-governance where we're exercising all these rights that we forgot that we had, why are we just trying to ban things? Why are we still in opposition if we're in charge? What's, you know, so that was like a decolonization moment. They had a collective aha of their own minds. And they started asking themselves, in our community, what do we want? Not what are we trying to stop, what do we want? And that was a powerful moment in the, in the growth of this new movement, the community rights movement. Well, so they started thinking in terms of local Bill of Rights protection. What rights do we want everyone to, to be able to be guaranteed to them in this town? And that was the framework. And then based on that, they were prohibiting certain cor corporate activities, stripping corporate rights, and refusing to, to, uh, to allow uh, state preemption to get in the way of what they were doing. So for example, Last November, the first major city passed a law in this movement um, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just last November, by a vote of 9 to 0 of the city council, even after they'd been threatened by the corporations with an immediate lawsuit, 9 to 0, they banned fracking in Pittsburgh. Now you might think, well, that's symbolic, who would frack in Pittsburgh? Well, actually, there were 200 leases in the process of being negotiated in the city of Pittsburgh. It was an emergency situation. All the other communities continue to regulate fracking. I don't know what that means, right? In Pittsburgh, in last November, they prohibited corporations from engaging in fracking. They stripped all the rights from, from fracking corporations, and they and they and they and they, and they, and they stripped preemption rights from the state government within one ordinance. And they did all of that in a three-page ordinance, which is extremely readable. You can read this, every word of this thing, with a high school education. No problem at all. They're not legalese. This is coming out of a rights movement, right? They're not being written by lawyers who are trying to confuse everybody, right? These are not the kinds of contracts you're asked to sign when you buy a car or rent a car. And Paul, how is that, how are they holding up against the corporate attorneys? So it's very interesting. So in, um, in these conventional single issue um, activism, you know, strategies that we've been in for a century, 
what, ha what normally happens in the courtroom is that we've got their experts, their scientists, arguing with our movement's experts and scientists about safe levels of harm. Right? The issue is specifically about how, how, how much of this chemical was safe in the bay before we hit some threshold that isn't safe. Right? Well, that's guaranteed to put a community to sleep. Yes. These ordinances are rights-based ordinances. They're actually not about fracking, logging, mining, ag. They're about rights. So what has to be done by the corporate attorneys is they have to actually argue in the court, in open court, that the corporation has more constitutional rights than the residents of the town. And that therefore it doesn't matter what the residents want because <coughs> the corporation is in charge in the town. They have to argue that because that's the way the ordinance was drafted. It's drafted for a very specific assault from the corporation. It isn't doing its job unless that, so basically they're trying to draw out the great law, the great lie about the United States, which is that we live in a democratic society. And we don't. And the corporation is forced to acknowledge that in its legal argument. The state legislatures or the state attorney general who are suing sometimes are forced to argue that local communities have no self-governing authority, even though their state constitutions very clearly say they do. And state constitutions are legally binding law. They're not just some you know, flourishy language, they're law. They're higher law than state law, state constitutions. And so corporations haven't challenged these yet. Now the states have in a few cases. With the ag laws that have happened, Pennsylvania farmers trying to ban corporate ag in the early years of this movement, a decade ago, the corporate, the corporate lawyers immediately went to the state government and they said, hey, this isn't legal, this is violating our rights. You know, deal with this, right? Because corporations are state actors, right? They have all of these super rights, so they don't even have to sue the rent, right? Their choice is to just make the state do it because the state has granted them all these special powers. So come on, state, you're there to protect us, do your thing. And so the state legislature drafted a law called ACRE, A-C-R-E, and I wish I could remember, but it's an acronym for this very duplicitous four words that basically was a law that says that local communities are prohibited from passing laws that ban corporate agriculture. That was the ACRE law. And they've been holding this up in the legislature for half a dozen years. And even if it passes, even if the state leg legislature passes this law, it's not going to change the communities that have passed or want to pass these local community rights ordinances. Just like if the federal government once again says to the state, you can't pass another medical marijuana law, what's going to stop people from doing it? Through the ballot box, they'll do it. And then there'll be another level of the crisis of jurisdiction. So it's actually not going to have its intended effect, even if it does manage to pass. Because what happens is, you've already mobilized a majority of the public in these communities. They're already clamoring for rights-based strategies to deal with these corporate harms that the state says are not harms, right? Legal harms. I just totally lost my train of thought. State law. And so what happens is that local communities are already empowered. Right? They're already feeling like there's something seriously serious going on here that is starting to give them political power again. So the last thing they're going to do when a corporation argues in an open court, or state government argues in an open court, you have no rights to do this, is outrage. It's not going to be going to sleep response. Right? And that's what we need too. We need citizens to be mobilizing it in larger and larger ways to challenge these oppressive laws that don't allow us to simply protect the health and welfare of our communities and of nature. And I want to briefly respond to the state and federal question from earlier. So the community rights movement that I'm a part of um, believes that I mean, the, the basic structure that's in place is that we're in phase one right now of the campaign, that you have to build real political power at the municipal level by passing one and then more and then more municipal ordinances in more and more towns within a state. Right? On whatever topics are most of urgency to you in your community, right? You're still dealing with topics of urgency. But you're doing it through a rights framework, not through a regulatory framework. Right? And once you have enough of these communities having passed the ordinances in your state,
phase two of the campaign begins. You build a community rights network that's statewide. And you start taking on the state constitution. And you insist on reforming the state constitution, which privileges corporate rights over the rights of human beings. They all do in the way that they're structured. And so Pennsylvania launched the Pennsylvania Community Rights Network in February of 2010. Um, and I want to read you just the beginning of what they wrote as the Chambersburg Declaration. So in, on February 20, 2010, <coughs> the Pennsylvania Community Rights Network, this is phase two, where 80 towns have passed this. This is before, before Pittsburgh. This is long before Pittsburgh which was November of 2010. So you had a couple dozen communities coming together for a weekend, and they formed the Pennsylvania Community Rights Network to begin to move power towards collective attack on, on what they see as un, uh, unacceptable state constitution that privileges corporate rights. Here's just the beginning of, of their uh, chambers for a declaration. That's the town that they met in. We declare that the political, legal, and economic systems of the U.S. allow in each generation an elite few to impose policy and governing decisions that threaten the very survival of human and natural communities. We declare that the goal of these decisions is to concentrate wealth and greater governing power through the exploitation of human and natural communities, while promoting the belief that such exploitation is necessary for the common good. We declare that the survival of our communities depends on replacing this system of governance by the privileged with new community-based democratic decision-making systems. We declare that environmental and economic sustainability can be achieved only when the people affected by governing decisions are the ones who make them. We declare that for the past two centuries, people have been unable to secure economic and environmental sustainability primarily through the existing minority rule system, laboring under the myth that we live in a democracy. We declare that most reformers and activists have not focused on replacing the current system of elite decision making with a democratic one, but have concentrated merely on lobbying the factions in power to make better decisions. And finally, we declare that reformers and activists have not halted the, halted the destruction of our human or natural communities because they have viewed economic and environmental ills as isolated problems rather than as symptoms produced by the absence of democracy. That's all right. <laughs> That's the beginning of the Chambersburg Declaration. If you go to Selden.org, it's there.